so we are probably in one of the most historic places in America when it concerns the American Revolutionary War. We're in Rome, New York, and we're here at Fort Stanwitz National Monument. Let's go ahead and check out Fort Stanwitz. Alright guys, so before we get into this video here at Fort Stanwitz, got to thank the sponsors of this episode, Addressing Gettysburg. If you want a great history podcast and you want all the information about Gettysburg that you could possibly ever handle, please check out Addressing Gettysburg, one of the number one history podcasts online today. So thank you to Matt Callery and the team from Addressing Gettysburg for helping sponsor the channel. And let's get into Fort Stanwitz. So as you walk into Fort, you're met with a very cool interpretive plaque talking about the importance of the location of Fort Stanowitz. It was right here on the Oneida Carry, which for centuries, it was the easiest way to move people, goods, and ideas. Hundreds of tons of trade goods passed over the Oneida Carrying Place and raw materials sent from the Great Lakes region passed through here going west. And this is a frontier trade uh, that was based on barter and these are exchange rates the crown approved in 1762 and you can kind of see some of the things they were trading a child's shirt um, to be sold for one martin or two raccoons 100 of black wampum for two raccoons and six muskrats i would not eat a muskrat one large silk handkerchief for a beaver or buckskin uh, Jew harps for one raccoon or three muskrats. And let's see, a white blanket for a man. One large beaver, two butt skins. Huh, so pretty cool. One pound of gunpowder was for one beaver or a pound of doe skin. Pretty cool. So as you come into the museum here in Fort Stanowitz, we, we were just discussing outside the importance of the Oneida carrying place, the trade goods that would be traded. And as you walk in, you've got another example of this. You've got one of the um, locals here probably trading a pelt of fox, I think that may be, for a, it looks like a musket with one of the Native Americans. You got another over there with some pelts of furs. And then you got several of the furs that would have been traded here, uh, fox, muskrats, um, beaver, doe skin, and any basically any animal you can get your hands on at have fur could be traded and i don't know why you would want a muskrat i mean they're not good eating i wouldn't think maybe maybe they thought so but uh raccoons were one of the biggest things that was traded and it's always neat to see those <laughs> uh this area that can connect canada and the great lakes with New York City in the Atlantic Ocean, but because we're using Mother Nature's water routes and not man-made water routes, sometimes there's places where Mother Nature doesn't accommodate us the way we'd like. So you have falls you have to go around, you have low water spots you have to go around, you have rapids you have to deal with, and so you have to make the, as the French said, the portages or portages as we have anglicized it, or uh, as the English phrased it at the time, you have to make a carry. And we are sitting in a place where you have to make, uh, to go to the map now, and make a carry or portage between the Mohawk River over here in our east and Wood Creek over here in our west. And this land break is anywhere from one to six miles, depending on the season of the year, the height of the waters. This was part of uh, that series of water routes that is the, one of the New York State throughways of, of the 18th century. And because of the land break here, it also made a good place where various cultures start to come together because uh, you have the portage business going on here. Uh, the Oneida, the British name it the Oneida Carrying Place because the Oneidas, are, this is part of their ancestral land, of course. And the Oneidas are engaged in the portaging business. Some of the German Palatines, who are mostly settled further east down to the 
Mohawk Valley are uh, engaged in the, in the portage business. And of course, uh, one of the big things that's going on with portaging is uh, supplies going uh, from the east up to British posts on Lake Ontario. But also, of course, you've got the fur trade flourishing as well. Part, part of those supplies going uh, east up to Ontario are to uh, carry out the fur trade up there at Fort Ontario. But because of this land break here, and a, a, a natural divide between settlements to the colonial settlement to the east and Indian land to the west, then this becomes another place where that fur trade does begin to flourish as well. I believe it was in the 1740s, a group of fur traders are complaining to the royal governor of New York that the Oneidas are basically forcing them to use Oneida labor to get across the carry, even though the, the Palatine Germans are charging less for their services, the Oneidas are saying you either use Oneida transportation or you don't go across the carry. As one visitor I mentioned this to, uh, a little light bulb went on his head and he said, oh, is the first Teamsters Union, huh? I said, yeah, actually, you're kind of right. <laughs> so that's the sort of thing you have going on here at uh, the United Carry. And of course, when we talk about now moving forward into times of warfare, when you've got the age old enemies, uh, France up here in New France or modern Canada, and the English down here in New York, the French now have a natural water invasion route down into British New York. Or conversely, the British have a place where they can launch their own attacks up the western water routes into Canada. And Various fortresses are built here early on by the British along the carry or on one side or other of the carry. Those come to very bad ends, uh, Fort Bull being the most uh, famous one, actually attacked by a French and Indian raiding party in March of 1756 and absolutely, completely, utterly destroyed by them. And then the British panicking later in 1756, thinking that the French are sweeping down into the valley after taking Fort Ontario from the British, and they destroy all their own forts and retreat back down to German flats. And they're to find that, no, the French had simply destroyed the British works here and retreated back up into Canada. But, so the Mohawk Valley sits wide open to French threats and uh, French attacks on both sides of the Mohawk River and what became generally known as the German Flats area until 1758 when finally the British put the big boy pants back on, uh, also realizing they need to reestablish, try to reestablish a little English power and authority within the lands of the Six Nations because the Six Nations are going, gee, looks like the French have got the upper hand here, maybe we ought to cut ties with the British and, and join with the French. So Fort Stanwix is to both uh, give the British a post back where they can begin to push attacks up towards Canada, but also to make a statement to the Six Nations Indians that no, we haven't given up, we are still here, we are a power to be reckoned with, we're putting the fort here to protect you as well as our settlements, and also this will be a place where the tra fur trade can be conducted. And so, the summer of 1758, uh, the fort begins to be built under the direction of General John Stanwix, hence the name. And by November of 1758, the British have enough of Fort Stanwix built that they can keep the first garrison here for the winter. And after that, uh, they continue to work on the fort and its role in the French and Indian War will be serving as a base of operations and supply line to uh, allow the British to, in as the fort's being built in 1758, to go out across those water routes across Lake Ontario and take Fort Frontenac from uh, the French, that's today's Kingston, Canada area. 1759, the uh, British force that's going out west to take Fort Niagara from the French, of course, is using their parts of their supply line or using Fort Stanwix. And finally, 1760, one of the three British armies converging on Montreal, the last major holding of the French, uh, comes up from New York City, up the Mohawk Valley, rests and refits and resupplies at Fort Stanwix for a couple of days, and then moves on out up those western water routes to join the other two British armies that are converging on 
Montreal, taking Montreal and forcing the French to then sue for peace and uh, their role in the French and Indian War or Seven Years War over here in North America comes to an end. Uh, just one little interesting note that British Army coming up here in 1760 is actually being led by the commander in chief of all British forces in North America, uh, Sir Geoffrey Amherst. So, you know, we did have, uh, for a couple days, we did have the commander in chief of all British forces in North America up here at the fort. One of the few celebrities we did have up here uh, from the 18th century. So that takes care of the French and Indian War. Uh, we fast forward to 1768, and we had discussed uh, that whole boundary line issue, and because the 1763 proclamation put in place by the king and his ministers is just being completely ignored by the colonists, the British government authorizes Sir William Johnson to come up here to the fort, meet with the Six Nations Indians, and negotiate what they hope <laughs> plan to be an actual uh, mappable and enforceable boundary line and the uh, treaty that uh, tri boundary line treaty that results in 1768 from that pushes the boundary line further west than what the king and his ministers had wanted. Sir William Johnson oversteps his authority, uh, thinks it's a good idea to keep the fort on the colonist side of things just in case it's ever needed again and finally strong arms the Oneidas into agreeing to establish the boundary line here at the fort and then run south and west down through the rest of the 13 colonies, mostly following water routes as it moves southward. And so at that point then, basically everything to the east of the fort becomes open for colonial settlement. Everything to the west of the fort is to remain once again in the hands of the Indians. But of course, we know the colonists were continuing to uh, break that agreement as well and move westward whenever they could. And while the, specifically the Treaty of Fort Stanwix is not mentioned in the Declaration of Independence laundry list of here's the reasons why we feel we now need to be independent, a general reference to the British government attempting to restrict what we feel is our natural God-given right to move as far westward as possible is mentioned as one of those many reasons to why we become independent and that chiefly comes from this Boundary Line Treaty of 1768. Uh, eventually, maybe even just a year or two before the uh, revolution starts, the British abandon the fort which now allows in 1776, the year after the revolution starts, for American troops to come up to the fort and begin to refortify it, occupy it. And of course, since we are now fighting against the British, we don't want to keep calling it by a British general's name. So they rename it in honor of the American general that sent the first troops from New Jersey up here. And that is General Philip Schuyler. And so for the Americans, it will become Fort Schuyler for the remainder of the revolution. And this is one that makes its biggest uh, hit, as we say, or claim to fame in our early American history. Uh, in August of 1777, uh, a British army using those western water routes coming out of Canada is going to lay siege to the fort as part of that larger British plan for invading into New York uh, from the water routes out of Canada, the main one, of course, under General John Burgoyne, coming south along Lake Champlain, Lake George, driving towards the Albany along the upper Hudson, and to force the Americans to split up their forces that might be arraying against him. General Barry St. Ledger, with a small contingent of British troops and a large contingent of American loyalists from the Mohawk Valley and various Six Nations Indian groups that they have finally convinced to honor the old British alliances and, and join with them, uh, in all equaling somewhere around 2,000 men or so, now begins their siege of the fort because the British underestimated what they were coming up against, didn't bring the heavy artillery they needed to quickly smash through the defenses, knock out the fort's cannon, kill or wound lots of soldiers, and basically they have to settle in and hope that they can run the Americans out of food, ammunition, and uh, other supplies, and demoralize them to the point that they will be willing to give up. 
Uh, luckily for the American side, they have Colonel Peter Gansfort uh, in command of his 3rd New York Regiment, two detachments of Massachusetts troops, and a small group of Oneida Indians in the fort. And the Oneidas have finally decided in this tug of war back and forth, or this uh, quest to remain neutral, as the Six Nations initially did, that the final straw for them now is the fact a large British army is invaded into their territory. Their Six Nation brethren have now come as, not as friends, but invaders with this British army. So they, that's one of many reasons that determines for them that the best course of action is to stay here, defend their ancestral homelands, and join the Americans who are helping that to happen by blocking the British from getting any further. The only major success the British will have during the campaign comes six miles to the east when uh, the local militia, 800 under General Nicholas Herkimer, attempting to come up to the aid of the fort, is ambushed by the better part of the Indians and loyalists with the British forces here. Uh, the Civil War nature of the fighting in the Mohawk Valley means that there's still a lot of Loyalist supporters living in the valley in 1777, and they send word up to the British commander, General St. Ledger, that Herkimer and his force is on his way. Molly Brandt, the uh, older sister of the war captain, uh, Joseph Brandt, uh, both Mohawks, uh, is the one that is mostly credited in history with having sent word up to her brother that their old, Nicholas, uh, their old neighbor, General Nicholas Herkimer, is now on the way up to come to the aid of the fort. And, of course, the militia uh, walks into an ambush at Oriskany because General Herkimer is goaded into advancing before he wants to uh, by his junior officers who are just looking to get this thing over and get back home so that they can get their uh, crop, begin to get their crops in and get back to their families, et cetera, et cetera etc. Herkimer had been wanting to wait until he heard the signal guns from the fort telling him that his messengers had arrived and that also part of his message was that he wanted a diversionary attack made out of the fort to draw British attention away from uh, his movements. Uh, that diversionary attack does finally happen. 250 soldiers under Lieutenant Colonel Marianus Willett go out with a three-pound cannon. They had already scouted out there. It's uh, believed by some historians now it was their night Indian scouts that went out early in the morning, scouted out what might be a good place to attack the British lines, and finding that the Indian and Loyalist encampments were largely empty and only lightly defended, that became the prime place. And so that force rushes out on the afternoon of August 6th, uh, drives in the few guards around, scatters the Indians and their families that are still in their camp, and proceeds to thoroughly plunder and destroy both the Loyalist and the main Indian camps. And by the time the British, get, who are caught completely off guard, get a force together to try to counter that, Willett and his men are already on their way back into the fort. The three-pound cannon and gunfire from the fort helps to... Uh, Try to keep the British at bay, and Willett and his men get back inside the fort without having lost a single man. Most historians also credit uh, the news of that attack on their camps reaching the Indians and Loyalists down at Oriskany as what finally uh, led the Indians and Loyalists to end their attack and make their way back up here, because at the time that uh, attack came out of the fort, they were in the process of beginning to mop up the last of Herkimer's resistance. And so that attack under Willett coming when it did was what generally saved the last of Herkimer's militia from being completely annihilated. So now that we know a little bit more about what we're looking at and the history of this place, let's do a little quick walk through the museum. I'm not going to show you everything. I want to leave something for you to come and see for yourself. As you walk in, you've got basically stories of the people who live here. And you've got uh, stories of the High, um, High Wendasi, or Dawsani. I, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible with names, okay? And being from a Native American reservation, I should know more, but I'm terrible. Um, they're basically translated to the people of the Longhouse. Anyway, they live here in the Mohawk Valley. And for a long time, and this was the same with the Cherokee people. Uh, we've been to Cherokee, North Carolina. But you've seen wampum belts. You've seen them in the videos from 
uh, Washington DC here on the channel. Wampum belt was used as currency at the time and it was one of the most popular currencies. And it spread out through all Native American tribes really. And I keep seeing wampum belts pop up in every Native American tribe that I go and study. I'm always seeing wampum belts. Um, so this is uh, uh, see a Hawatha belt. Um, this was something that the Onondaga nation here, the Senecas, um, and you know, all these nations of Iroquois Confederacy, they use these wampum belts. They will have different patterns on them according to what tribe you were with. And then you've got um, some more wampum belts here. This is the uh, wampum belt from the uh, Gaswanita. And so these were things that were traded. And then this is talking about that, that Native American influence here, the people that lived here in the Lake Ontario uh, region, the Oneida Cary region, and talking about those different tribes that lived in this place and their role in trade were the Europeans, and then the clashes that started happening over ownership. So there were treaties that were signed here that we heard about at Fort Stanowitz. And this is all going to lead into things like the French and Indian War, things like the American Revolution. And this, this becomes the driving force and the backbone for those conflicts. Yes, the American Revolution was fought over taxation without representation, but in the background, you have this as one of the main contributing factors as well. And that's something a lot of people often miss is the, the Native American relationship to this. Um, this is a beaver uh, felt hat. They were very popular at the time and they were prized by European men. And between March and, uh, 1767 and March 1768, 4,127 pounds of beaver skins were traded at Fort Niagara. That's a lot of beavers who died for their skin. And then there became a fight over fur here. Uh, friends and foes were made on the basis of the fur trade with changing markets, competition between official agents and renegade traders became fierce over hunting forced American Indians to range further west to obtain furs. And this is one of the driving forces of these conflicts. The Native Americans were being drove out of their lands because of the fur trade itself. Because European and the, the Europeans, the British, the French, they were all seeing that furs were very productive. They were very expensive. So it's pretty cool to see this highlighted here. Let's take a look at some Native American artifacts from the region. Uh, Tomahawk, you're going to see this come into play as a battle implement all during the French and Indian War and American Revolution, especially at the Battle of Oriskany. And if you watch a episode of Battlefield Detectives on Oriskany, you'll see, you gotta go watch it, because you'll see the evidence of how this weapon was implemented that they ended up finding, uh, contributing to the battlefield of Oriskany. And then you have the arrowheads, which was not only used as a tool of war, they were made from flint, um, things like, um, well, the flint ranges, ranged differently in the areas you lived. Where I live, there's a lot of flint arrowheads but they're very different from what you find here. But they will be traded. So a lot of the flint that was made from this area even made its way down south to the Alabama Gulf Coast where I live because it was traded. And then you have things like uh, mortars, net sinkers, and you've got, let's see, this is a, what I call a pounding rock. Um, but this was used to make different things. They can make medicines in this thing. They can make um, cultural medicines that was important to their people. They could also use these to pound up meal or whatever they may find a use for. And you will generally find these a lot of times. And then here's some, uh, let's see, these are, I guess you could call this a bead, um, like a beaded necklace, I guess is what, what term I'll use. And then pipe bowls and things like that. So just different artifacts from here. And then as you walk through, it's talking about the building of Fort Stanowitz. And this item right here, well, that's not a pipe from the time. You don't smoke that. That is only one of, it's, it's one of the only two originals that's ever been found in archeological investigations in North America. And this is a match case. 
Now, when I say match case, you're probably thinking what I thought when they explained this to me was, oh, okay, I'm gonna see a box that matches were kept in. <laughs> no, this is not that kind of match case. This is a British Grenadier match case that was used to light fuses on grenades. I bet a lot of you didn't know there was grenades during the American Revolutionary War. Let's show you how this worked. So, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm looking at this and we say grenade and I'm thinking about a World War II grenade, pineapple grenade, you know, you pull the pin, throw the grenade. Well, in this case, it was pretty much kind of the same implement. This is a grenade from the time period. And as you can see, there's a rope on it that is called a fuse. Inside of this will be gunpowder. Um, maybe at some point they may have threw in some kind of shrapnel in here as well. And what you would do instead of pulling the pin, throwing a grenade, throwing the grenade, you would take and light it using one of these. And this is actually displayed, and they were showing this to me a minute ago. They got a reproduction attached to here. And this little plug comes out. That is your fuse. It will be a slow match. These air, these holes on the side are used to ventilate it to keep it smoldering. You take this out, light your grenade, and toss it. And in return, well, you're blowing up your enemy. So, no, not a pineapple grenade, but the same concept. Um, so, yeah, you learn something new. I learned something new today because I'm going to be honest. I didn't know these were implemented during the American Revolution. So this is a copy of the 1723 Treaty of Paris, which was an agreement that made, um, it was made at the end of the war between the British victors and French and Spanish. This was at the end of the French Indian Wars or Seven Years Wars. European peace negotiations did not include the Native Americans. So these are all things that's going to lead to the Treaty of 1768. And this is a boundary that was imposed by the proclamation of 1763 that created tensions on the frontier. In 1768, Sir William Johnson and leaders of the American Indian nations met here at Fort Stanowitz. And they were going to relocate this boundary, this line separating that. Sir William defiantly grabbed hundreds of thousands of acres for land specula uh, speculators by asserting six nation claims of custody of land south and west of New York. Over 3,000 American Indians from Six Nations, Shawnee, Delaware, Mingo, and other dependent tribes attended the treaty negotiations. Ignoring Crown instructions, Sir William Johnson encouraged the Six Nations to draw a new boundary line favorable to their mutual interests. Rather than settling tensions, frontier strife between colonists and American Indians increased. And these are things that's going to help lead to the road to the American Revolution. And as you walk through here, they've got just a tremendous amount of information and a video here highlighting some of Fort Stanwitz. And then talking about the Six Nations Alliance. Um, the Six Nations were caught between opposing sides as a Revolutionary War started. Each side sought to attain the allegiance of the nations. Initially, loyalists and patriots wanted American Indians to remain neutral during the war, but later tried to coax them on each of their sides. The Six Nations resisted these in later attempts until the war came to the Oneida Caribbean place. Here where we are, under extreme pressure from within and without, the people of the Six Nations chose their own individual paths to war. And at this time, the Oneida Patriots joined the United States, and members of the Oneida were also joined the British. And what you have is that Iroquois Confederacy that is at the time splitting all of these tribes. So anyway, let's look at some more uh, artifacts here. And <laughs> these are some really, really neat items here. This is a field desk. This is all original. Um, so this is a field desk that would have been used during this time. This is a lamp. So your source of light and a wooden or bone pipe pretty cool and then here's some of the th other things you would have found in the fortification um, these are um, fork and a knife you've got some what is this looks like some copper cufflinks some braids and then you have a piece of chinaware 
some more copper and then one of your bottles where you kept your wine or whiskey or whatever you were wanting to drink so if you're wanting to know anything about Fort Stanowitz, I highly suggest coming in this museum before you go out to the fortification, watch some of these videos, see some of these items, and you'll quickly learn some of the stuff that you have not been taught in history books as to the leading causes of the American Revolutionary War, which was, you know, yes, taxation without representation was one of those. But a lot of it was the contributing factors of the fur trade, the the treaties that had been set in place dividing land between the uh, colonists and the Native Americans. And all of this is going to come to a boiling point from things that signed here at Fort Stanowitz, and it's going to, well, lead to everything that's going to happen afterwards. So let's look at some more artifacts. Let's get out here and head to the fortification. So these are some of the items that you would have found during the time. These are all original artifacts, which is crazy. A hatchet, some shears, buttons, bells. And then if we come over here, there's an ax, some gun flints, some, uh, let's see, wine bottles. There's a musket butt plate, belt buckle. Um, there's a pipe hook. So all kinds of things here. And then a, uh, another set of shears there. And then some of the other things, Jews harps, brass thimbles. And what is this? This is a scrub brush. Check that out. And then horse bits. And then over here you have some of the military um, finds from the time period. You have the vent pitch. You have a worm to bring rounds out of the rifle. You've got some of the flint lock locks or subs. And then you have what appears to be a small, pe a small cannonball, some musket balls, a pipe. You have buttons and button molds. Um, you have game pieces. You have buckles. And then if we go over here, you'll see some more very cool artifacts here. And I know this is just a rough, rough walk, but uh, this is actually a piece of a musket barrel that had been reused as a tent pig. And then the powder horn, um, you've got a little small coffee cup there, some coins of the time. And you see that coin right there? Well, I actually have one on uh, from the West India company and that's off the Admiral Garner shipwreck so now let's go over and check out the actual fort as it was constructed in 1776 and how it looked at the time and you can come here and do the same so let's head to the fortification and it'll take me a minute to go over you'll see me in two seconds walking into the fort on this path is an ancient trail where the traders, soldiers, Native Americans, and travelers crossed going to trade at the Oneida Carrying Place. So when people think about Fort Stanowitz here in Rome, New York, they often think about, as they see the fort, the 1777 siege and the uh, 1776 occupation of American forces. But they only focus Normally, what's inside of the fort walls? Well, in this field you see right behind me was also part of the fortification, as there were many women and children inside of this area during 1776 and 1777. The fort couldn't hold everyone, so a lot of the women and children would come out here, and the women were tasked with the everyday tasks that women would normally do during the time, which is nursing which is cooking and doing the laundry. So outside in this area you see behind me would have been that area where a lot of the women would do their daily tasks. So pretty neat. So I am now walking into the main gate 
of Fort Stanowitz. And we're getting ready to finally go inside and check out the fortification for itself. So let's go see Fort Stanowitz. So immediately, one of the things I noticed before if we're even going inside of the fort is the construction of the walls here and how closely resemble to the uh, resemblance to the original foundation of the fort that they have recreated here, even using the wooden pegs that are used to drive the posts here onto the boards that you see here, which offer the construction of the fort. That is something I have never seen. Um, this is, of course, I think my first wood fortification I've ever really been to outside of Fort Mims. So this is neat. So as we walk in here, you'll automatically see some things here about the life at Fort Stanwitz. Some of the crops that they grew for life here. And no, they didn't have bicycles, so don't worry about that. But they had different crops that would grow, things like corn and cabbage and beets and different types of peas, all kinds of stuff here that they would grow and eat. And you also would have been challenged by a guard. And this is a recreation of one of the guard shacks here at Fort Stanwitz that would have been posted at the front gates. And well, I thought it was an outhouse at first, but it's actually a guard shack. So as we stand outside the main walls here of the fortification, you'll immediately see the moat, which aided in defense. And this would have, of course, maybe had water in it as well. And you would also be able to envision in your mind for yourself what Captain Joseph Bloomfield said about this fortification in 1776 that defended the Mohawk Valley. He said, it is large and well situated. The examination of this fortification gave me a better idea of the strength and importance of a fort than anything I have ever seen or read. And he wrote an account of this in 1776, or this account of this fortification. And I couldn't say it any better myself. This is absolutely, incredibly, incredibly very well reconstructed to the original fortification. So upon initially walking into the fortification, you'll see what he's talking about in the account that he gave in 1776 that we just discussed as you get closer to the fortification even. And that is, of course, you get the moat right here surrounding the main fort walls. You've got a palisade and you've also got a initial line of defense with the wooden stockade that's out in front of the fort. Behind that, you got this moat. And then once you get to the main portion of the fort, if you make it or happen to make it up this moat, then you have to go over these sharpened pointed sticks that look something like chevaux de free or abati. They are initially got serving the same purpose as that. This is just the Revolutionary War, French and Indian War timeframe materials of that defense of one of these wooden fortification structures. And you also have the bridge that you see behind me, which would have been able to be let up and down. And then you walk into the main guardhouse or gate of the fort, if you will, the main entrance, and you're inside of the fortification itself. Now, I do want to highlight this particular entrance here because if you look to the sides of this door, you'll see two big metal pieces and two looking, uh, you know, round looking drum things. So what this is, is basically kind of like a counterweight. And this will allow you to raise this door up and down. So you're able to close and open the door. And this is also serving in line of defense. And then behind that, you have these big wooden doors, which offer another line of defense. So this fortification, just to even breach it, took an act to Congress, basically. Because you first have to go through the stockade in front of the fort. You After you go up the 
parapets. Then you come down into a moat that may have been, may or may not have been filled with water, according to how much rain you get at the time. And then you got to main fort walls here. You've got people on top of the fort, cannons looking down on you, small arms looking down on you. And then you have this abati or chevaux de free looking stuff that you've got to go across as well. And then you've got this bridge and then you've got these doors. So it was an act of Congress to even breach a fortification, which makes sense why the British seized this fortification. They were weakening the defenses here at Fort Stanowitz because Fort Stanowitz, as he wrote in 1776, that captain said, this is one of the most well defended examples of a fort that I have ever seen. And you see it for yourself. So going back to this draw uh, drawbridge, if I can get my words out real quick, the park ranger who is working for the National Park Service inside of the fortification today just told us they don't know exactly what was kind of the system in place here at Fort Stanowitz because there was no record of it. But this is the best example based on other fortifications that were around the area of what it may have looked like. So, neither or less, this is how drawbridges on some of these fortifications, even if it for some reason wasn't here, would have operated during the time frame. So, pretty cool. All right, so now we are inside of the actual fortification here at Fort Stanwitz, and you can see another recreation of what a guard shack here would have looked like. No, this isn't an outhouse. Uh, I, I wouldn't have mistaked it for an outhouse too, guys, so don't feel bad. But this is what one of the guard houses would have looked like. But you know, everywhere we go, we always have to include the cannons, the artillery, because that's one of my favorite things to see. So let's, uh, let's take a look at one. So this particular gun is a reproduction cannon from the time period. And this is actually fireable. And the reason why I know that is because they have the, the leather over the vent protecting anything from going inside of the vent. But I wanna show you a difference between Civil War cannon and these Revolutionary War cannon that I think is just very fascinating to me. And that is the cleated wheels. So, especially at places like Oriskany and the military road that ran through there, that road was very swampy when it was wet. You gotta remember there's a lot of snow here every year. I think even today it gets like something like 120 inches of snow a year. That's a lot of snowfall. So, especially in areas like this, going up and down these valleys and these roads, they're very muddy, very sloppy, very rocky at times. And then you gotta go through the snow. These cleats just aid in these cannon being able to travel. And I think that's just fascinating to see that on these. I don't know if there's any examples of this on Civil War cannon. I'm not 100% sure, but I know this particular reproduced cannon here has that example, which is, which is just really neat to me. So what you're looking at here is a reproduction of the artesian quarters. What was an artesian quarter? So just like any town, any fortification, you have to have things fixed, things built. And these artisans were specially traded, uh, well, people with special trades, such as carpenters and your blacksmith that would make things for the fort. Now, at this time, you gotta remember, we don't have factories and we don't have all this junk we have today. I think, in my opinion, it was a simpler and better time, but that's just my opinion. But you would have to have everything handmade for this fortification down to this, which is the window uh, locks here so you can have your windows open during the day and the wind's not blowing them down so they would make things like this they would make pieces for your gun they would have gunsmiths in here that would fit your rifles they would make things like i mean just everything everything here was built by some kind of person inside of this fortification and this is where they lived and worked and in may of 1778 lieutenant colonel manius willett had said something to the effect in an account that the superintendent engineer's department would see that all the sentries boxes are in good order and fixed as not to be blown down with every trifling wind. It is likewise to be careful that the gates and fencing are fixed in such a manner to prevent horses and cattle from getting into the meadows and gardens. They didn't want the horses and cattle eating all the crops and they didn't want these sentry boxes, the things that look like outhouses, to be blown over with every 
wind that would come through. So it was their job to make sure all of the stuff was in good repair and working order. So let's go in and take a look uh, through these doors at some of their quarters and conditions and what it would have looked like at the time. So we're going to try to poke our head in so we can see here. But uh, if you look, this is what it would have looked like inside of one of these workhouses. You can see the horses in here. Well, not the horses that go nay, but the horses you work on. And the barrels and different implements of tools and things that they would have used here to build and construct the things of the fortification. So the same Lieutenant Colonel Will Lent in April of 1778 recorded that the Southwest and Northwest bastions fitted up in the best manner possible for the reception of beef and pork that is in the garrison. The life and preservation of Fort Stanwitz or Fort Schuyler at the time depended on the preservation of the food. So this is the Southwest bomb proof. And you can see here, it gives you some information. This was actually the portion that was used as a hospital during the siege here in 1777. So, the reason for that was shrapnel couldn't travel as easily into this. Now, as we walk in through, it is very dark, a lot darker than what you think it is on camera. And this is where you would store your powder too, because you didn't want it to be exposed to the elements and you did not want it exploding. So this area was highly protective, which also just happened to also be good for the storage of your gun or of your food and beef, which is, what they have it set up with now in some of the depictions. You've got the storage of the gunpowder, the storage of the food, and then you also have the depiction of it set up as the hospital during the 1777 siege here in the fortification. So the, the name Fort Schuyler is what the Americans called it, as you heard earlier in this episode, as they renovated this fort after the British had let go of it. So, as with most of you, I typically want to know what life was like for the soldiers and the men who lived and defended this fortification. Well, a soldier's only as good as his stomach, right? Well, a soldier during this time frame, especially stationed right here in this fortification, was issued one pound of beef, one pound of, one pound of bread, and one cup of vegetables from the garden that was outside of this fortification, and that was their ration. Now, how do soldiers spend time here inside of Fort Stanwitz? What they would do is they would play board games. There's been evidence found that you saw in the museum of gaming pieces. They will also um, gamble and they would do, you know, music, different things to entertain yourself. Gambling, however, was something if you were caught doing, you would be found guilty of disobedience. This was recorded in an officer's journal in 1777 here in Fort Stanwitz. So the soldier, drummer, fifer, whoever it may be that was caught gambling would be punished. So yeah, don't don't get caught rolling dice in Fort Stanwitz or Fort Schuyler because, um, well, you're going to face the consequences. So here at Fort Stanwitz, if you are caught gambling and you face punishment, for instance, well, you would be punished, but you would be punished publicly. You would be thrown in a prison cell. That was only for the most major offenses. So if you'd done something kind of minute, well, they would punish you publicly by flogging you in front of the people or putting you in a stockade in front of everybody or let people throw potatoes and cabbage at your head or whatever. But they have not reconstructed a actual um, guardhouse where you would be kept but they have transformed this room into what it may have looked like. And it wasn't too bad. I mean, you had a bed and you just had to stay in here until your sentence was carried out of what you had to do as a form of public punishment. And let's see what's behind the curtain here. Oh, here's your rack. This is where you'll end up. Well, I mean, it's not too bad. I mean, until you get out there and flog in front of everybody. So right now we're sitting inside of one of the rooms here at Fort Stanwitz that they have reconstructed to um, depict of what you have been put into if you were considered a um, person who had committed a crime or punishment. But I want to tell you a little bit more about the life of the people here at Fort Stanwitz. You know, outside of gambling or playing games or things like that that they would do for entertainment, 
The soldier had to eat at the time. And what did they eat? What were they issued here at Fort Stanwitz to eat? Well, it was things like this right here, which is one pound of beef, one pound of bread, and one cup of your vegetables. And that is what these soldiers here at Fort Stanwitz had to eat. That was their ration portion. So life here at Fort Stanwitz wasn't horrible, but it wasn't the best in the world either. So just sitting in here though, it kind of gives you a perspective of what life may have been like at the time. So yeah, if you ever come here to Fort Stanwitz, I highly suggest just taking a minute, setting in one of these recreated barrack rooms and kind of putting yourself in the position of what it may have been like here at the time frame. So we're making our way back out of this room now and we are headed to show you more of Fort Stanwitz and what life was like here. And we have another um, example of one of the artillery pieces at the time here. And that's a little fella. Uh, he is very small. And you can see the crown stamp on the top for King George. And very, very cool. I don't even know, I'm not going to lie, I don't know the proper name of this artillery piece because I haven't really ever seen many of them. So yeah, that's a new one on me too. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to see the only original piece of the fortification still here. Now, as we said before, you had the Northwest Casemate um, or the gunpowder magazine, if you want to call it that, that was constructed and they had food and storage for the food there ordered, but they also had it in the Southwest, but this is a North Casemate that we are talking about here. So this is a example of what it would have looked like. And after evaluating artifacts of this North Casemate, archeologists concluded that these rooms were occupied by officers. So this is where your officers would have lived. An entry from a man by the name of John Barr in 1780 drew for the rooms and that Lieutenant Hyatt and I drew no on the left and north side of the fort. Well, these are where your officers would have lived. And the only original piece of this fortification that you're going to see when you come here is this fireplace. That is absolutely cool. So the brick portion of the fireplace is still here, and it was here during the siege in 1777, and it is now enclaved, encased in glass. So this is uh, very, very cool. Now let's see if we can't get an overhead shot for you. So this is the original part of the fort, the only original part of the fort that remains is this fireplace. So that is the only original portion of the fort you will see when you come here to Fort Stanwitz. And we're gonna take you through and show you some more rooms here that they have set up. And then we're gonna get out of here and head to another location. But this is your orderly room. And this is basically the headquarters of the fort. So, so let's go in here and take a look at this. So two rooms that have been reconstructed right now to depict some of the rooms that was here in the headquarters building at the time of the fortification. And this is a staff dining room and an orderly room. This is the place that if you committed a crime, you would be tried. Um, guys were committed, had committed crimes in here. Uh, there was a guy by the name of Peter Gusvort if I'm even pronouncing that right, um, that recorded entries of guys being convicted for things like sleeping on post or um, making bad barters with Native Americans, things like that. And these are crimes guys will be convicted of. Well, this is the room that that would have happened in. And then over here would have been your commandant's quarters. And a regular soldier didn't receive much pain. The commandant, however, did receive a little bit more and enough to make correspondence back to home. Gavort's uh, wife wrote him that her fear was that he would be contained here in the fort, starving to death, and forced to surrender to those brutes. So she was very worried about her husband. But this is what the commandant's quarters may have looked like for the commandant of this fortification. 
So a lot of times you will have visiting officers visiting here and they will have to have a place to stay. And you, officer ha you had officers who lived here and they would have to, have to have a place to stay. And then you would have surgeons who were here and they would have to have a place to operate. So what you have is a couple of rooms here of what it would have looked like if you're a visiting officer or if you're an officer stationed here at the fort, these are what your living conditions may have looked like. And then over here, this is what it would have looked like where a surgeon may have operated or you were, again, an officer living here as well. So it's made it depict a couple of different things here. So also in this fortification, you would have families living in some of these places as well, like we mentioned earlier. And this is where you may have lived if you were here at this fortification. And I gotta tell you, it's a little bit colder walking in here, but you have a fireplace that would have been in these rooms as well. It's small, but it is doable. So if you were a junior officer, this is one of the rooms you may have lived in. And I've got to tell you, it, this is probably the neatest experience I've ever had traveling anywhere because I love colonial history. I don't have that where I live. And seeing this is absolutely just wild and cool. So if you were a common soldier during your stay here at Fort Stamwitz, this is where you would have lived in these soldiers' barracks, soldiers' quarters. This is where your enlisted men were living. And you've got racks upon racks upon racks and a table in the middle and fireplace at the end. And this would have been probably where I would have lived. <laughs> but, I, you know, the construction of these bunk beds is pretty, pretty cool. You have uh, pegs for your coats and accoutrements. And then they are just kind of pieced together themselves. And you have a bed like this filled with hay, straw, um, they wouldn't have been filled with feathers on top of a board, and that is where you slow. I mean, so not horrible, not the best, but not horrible. At least you went on the floor. So we're inside of the missionaries' quarters here in the fort. A missionary here would have tried to convert the Oneida Indian over the Christianity, and just wrong in my opinion. But it is what it is. Um, so that's what happened. Anyway, I whether or not you agree with it, that's just totally, you know, all of our own opinions here. But uh, as for me, I didn't agree with it. Um, but that's what history happened, and that's what was going on at the time. And the missionaries would have lived here, and this is where they would stay during their time here at the fort. But one of the things I want to show you here is this. This is the wampum belt we talked about earlier, and this would have been used for trade. This was a big source of trade of all of, almost all Native American uh, tribes. So pretty cool. Um, pretty neat to see that in person. <laughs>
we're making our way out of here and we're headed to some of the last rooms here. Your sutler, who would have been the one to sell the goods, trade the goods with the Oneida here. And this is what it would have looked like inside of this room. You can see they'll have their little counter set up, fur pelts here, and then different things to trade and sell. Um, so this was uh, what the sutler looked like. This was your store. This was your grocery store at the time, and uh, pretty neat. All right, so we're back out in the courtyard of, or parade ground, if you will, of the fortification itself, and we are going to take a look at one more artillery piece here. I've got to get my cannon selfie, and uh, this is the one I want to do it by. So here you are, another artillery piece of the time. Pretty cool. All right, so now we're headed to the top of the fortification here, and we're going to talk about the siege of 1777. And there was a soldier here by the name of McCartney, and he belonged to a New York regiment that was here, but his wife had a child at Fort Stanwitz. When did she have it? She had it during the siege of 1777 after being wounded in the leg by an artillery shell. So she was wounded here, at Fort Stanwitz during the siege. And that night she gave birth to a baby known as the Siege Baby of 1777 after she was wounded in the buttocks to be more precise. Um, so yeah, that is, uh, that is what happened with that situation. Very famous story that's told here at the fortification and one that many people forget. Now, as we stand here, apparently you can't go any further than this on top of the fortification. They have it ripped off here, so we're going to respect that and not go there. But the British during the siege were coming from the north end of the fortification, back towards the city of Rome. If you come here, you look towards, you can see the church and the steeple of the church. That is the direction from the British were coming, and they were also coming back towards the right a little bit. That is where the British were approaching. But if we go up here, let's take a look at the top of the fortification. So this is your view from the top of the fortification of Fort Stanwitz. And on the top, you would have had cannon placed all around the bastions of the fortification. Looks like they've been doing work this morning. So the cannons are doing a good job. Um, but this is where, as an artilleryman, your station would have been. Now this gun in particular would have helped in defense of the British as they're approaching Fort Stanwitz. For the simple the, you know, reason, the direction is pointed. And that is the direction from which the British were coming. So these guns on this bastion right here and this location would have also contributed to that. And it just gives you a sense of how much coverage you have on these cannons. And then these guns were covered the south end. But these cannon are all here in defense of Fort Stanwitz. And then, of course, at the top is Old Glory. So the siege here at Fort Stanwitz in 1777 saw the troops here. They were struggling. They, they were worried they were not going to have enough provisions as the British were laying siege. And then, well, um, the British, they get the... Right, I did. They thought to take a bunch of Seneca and Mohawks and go to Oriskany and tackle the Ty uh, Tyrone County militia who were making their way to reinforce the troops here at Fort Stanwitz. And Fort Stanwitz was hoping they got here because it was it was getting to a really bad ordeal here at Fort Stanwitz. Well, the British ended up coming back and finding their camp here outside of the fort walls raided. They laid siege a little bit more to the fortification and then thought it'd be best to leave because the Seneca and Mohawks said they've had enough of this junk, they're going home. And that's what they did. You gotta understand at this time that the Native Americans were helping the British. They were a big portion of why the British were being able to continue fighting. And then you've also got the colonial army who are getting the support from the Oneidas as well as other 
Native American tribes. And they are being able to do so well because of that. So the Native American influence here was contributing a lot. And a lot of the factors that went into why the American Revolution was fought to begin with was basically breaking down into two levels, land and trade, land and trade. You have taxation and representation. Yes, that's just fueling the fire of what's happening during the start of the American Revolution. But it breaks down to land and trade. And the reason why the Native Americans are important, because there are keys to both the land and trade during the time. So here at Fort Stanwitz, St. Ledger ends up going back to Canada and the fort stays in American hands and the rest is history. Pretty neat. So this has been a surreal experience for me personally. I have wanted to come to Fort Stanwitz since I was a kid. I've read about this place and this was a cross off the history bucket list for me. And if it wasn't for you guys watching these videos, supporting what I do, and especially my biggest supporter is going to be my wife for allowing me to be able to do this, putting up with me doing this, walking around talking to myself, sounding stupid, and joining me on these trips. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do this. So being able to do this means a lot to me personally. And being able to visit cool places that I've wanted to see my entire life like this place is something that... I never thought I'll be able to do. So thank you guys for watching. Thank you for your support. And most of all, thank you to my wife for supporting me. Um, sorry guys, she's my biggest fan. Um, but we're going to see more places like this. And yeah, this is, uh, this is pretty cool. So until next time, guys, I want to thank you for watching. Thank the National Park Service for allowing me to do this at Fort Stanwitz today. They've been awesome nothing but accommodating and well until the next adventure keep preserving history stay safe we'll see you from the next place <laughs>